engineer here at Tension. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about sort of how we came to use Go for some of our projects, a little bit about how we made that decision, and what our experience has been. So first of all, what is Go? Uh, so Go is a new language recently developed at Google. Uh, it's only a couple years old. I think it's in 1.1 right now. And this is so this is sort of their like mission statement for it. This is their PR message, but it's surprisingly accurate. This goes gaining a lot of traction, and it's sort of every week you see more posts on Hacker News about people who wrote, who like rewrote something in Go and saw a massive speed up or had like a great developer experience. And we've we've sort of seen some of those benefits as well. So let's dive into a little bit about sort of what Go is before I talk about how we ended up deciding to, to use it to your attention. So Go is a programming language, uh, Golang. Uh, one quick tip, if you ever want to Google anything and look up anything about Go, you can't search Go because you're going to get the board game. So you have to search Golang, and then the right things are going to come up. Uh, I had to learn that the hard way. So Go, the main programming language, is a pretty standard programming language. Uh, a few of the sort of questions that people have immediately when they hear about one is it's statically typed, it's compiled, uh, it's garbage collected, it is not object oriented, but it has basically some object oriented capabilities. And so this is sort of a sample Go program to, to compute the tenth number of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, as you can see, it has a package system sort of like Java. The, the syntax for importing is a little bit different, but the semantics are pretty much exactly the same. Uh, it has the main function as an entry point, similar to almost all programming languages. And this basically looks pretty standard. Uh, there's one sort of point of confusion that is like throws everyone off a little bit, is that the variable names and declarate and types are reversed. So this is a function that takes a single variable and of type int, uh, so they're like reversed from how they usually would be, and it returns a single int. But otherwise, pretty, pretty standard stuff. Three reverse of C. They, they say they got it in Pascal. Good. I can't speak much to that, but that's what they say. No, they're probably right. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned, the code is organized into packages, uh, makes a distinction between pointers and values, similar to C. Uh, it's passed by value, and it doesn't have objects, but it has structs, uh, which are pretty standard for C style structs. Uh, you can define methods on structs, but they're not exactly called methods. But the idea is you define a struct that it can be called, or sorry, a function that can be called by a struct. So, in this case, if you have any variable of type pointer to a person, you can call that variable dot greet, and it will call the greet function, passing in itself as the self variable there, and display its own name. Um, so that's somewhat object oriented. Uh, the also sort of interesting thing that's shown here is that the, there's no public or private keywords in Go. Instead, well, private in this case means, means package private, and uh, public is world, read, sorry, world readable. And the way that public and private are determined is instead of keywords, they're actually determined by whether or not the first letter of the variable name is capitalized, or sorry, of the field name is capitalized, which is a little bit, uh, looks a little strange at first, but it actually ends up being very nice because it's much less verbose, and it sort of is intuitive at a quick scan what you're going to be able to use outside the package, uh, what's being used internally, what's more private. Okay, so going through a couple other things. Go has first class functions. It has a really nice fast uh, facility that functions can actually return multiple values. So you can actually declare a function to return any number of values. So that leads to sort of the, the really common error handling pattern in Go is the sort of the universally used pattern for this is that any function that conceivably returns some sort of error returns an error object as the last return value, and then it's the responsibility of the caller to check that value to see whether or not an error was produced. Uh, so there's no exceptions in Go. Instead, the idea is to basically catch the errors right when they occur and error out or do sort of however you would do your error handling. Uh, it also has Go routines built in, which are 
essentially uh, concurrent, the idea is they're essentially functions executing concurrently in the same address space uh, with their own stack, of course. And to do that, you just call go and then a function call, and it'll start that function call on a separate go routine. So they're conceptually very similar to threads. A few nice development features. Uh, go is a really nice dependency system. Um, the way that it's built, the language, the executables actually compile really fast. Uh, in order of like we have some pretty good programs that we compile and they take seconds as opposed to you might see much longer in other languages. It's also a pretty small language. The actual spec online is like one pretty long document as opposed to like a book for Java. So it's actually pretty easy to just go through and sort of feel like you have your head wrapped around the language and not be really surprised by a lot of features that might crop up. It also has a pretty strong standard library space. Uh, there's like an HTTP server built in. There's some really nice subprocess handling modules. There's a good one for working with time. And because it's sort of, there's sort of a growing community around Go, there's a lot of good plugins for like popular text editors. OK, so there's a few other things that ship with Go. And they're worth mentioning because a lot of them are done very nicely. So Go build is just the compile. But Go format is kind of interesting because Go basically enforces a specific style on all of your code. So if you run Go format on your Go source files, it'll actually format them in a deterministic way using like certain amounts of spaces and certain amount of uh, like line breaks and spacing between different parts. So this is sort of a way of ensuring that all the code within a project is styled the exact same way without having to have any sort of disputes over what that way is going to be. Uh, Go's very opinionated about a lot of things. Uh, that's one of them. Another, I guess Go test is pretty interesting because it actually, Go has like a very small unit testing framework built into it uh, that if you're going to do like heavy unit testing, we use the Go check package, which basically is JUnit ported to Go and works in a lot of the same ways. But it's very easy to sort of hook into that because Go test has its own, or Go has its own testing built into it. One sort of weak point about Go that is definitely is a discussion that is like currently in place about how to how to improve this. It's definitely on the radar. Is the go path environment variable? So this is the environment variable that you set that determines where the go tool is going to look for all of your library for all of your installed libraries as well as all of your source code. And it's also going to install if you go get things, it's going to install those into that into the go path, a subtree of the go path. So this. It's a little weird because it's not quite transparent, and also it becomes hard to separate out like code from different projects because Go might be installing if you want to have, like one project and, and another project that you're working on on your own. Uh, Go's going to be installing the code from that to the same place, which you don't really want, and it's going to look for the dependencies in the same place, which you may not necessarily want. So uh, one fix for that is to just like kind of toggle between different Go paths when you work on different projects. But right now there isn't like a really clean fix, but I think it's. I know that it's in the works. OK, so just a little bit more about Go as we kind of transition into how we use it for MongoDB is the, the Go driver for MongoDB, which is it's one of the actually not, I don't know, as well known as, as well known as some of the other drivers, but it's a really, really excellent mature driver. It's not one that was actually written at 10 uh, It was written by a community member, Gustavo Niemeyer, who's kind of a heavy hitter in both the Go world and the MongoDB world, so he's really sort of a good person to write this. Uh, it's that's the package, and he also has a website there that has some really nice docs. And it uses uh, it's very standard. Uh, it works exactly as you'd expect it. He added a little bit of syntactic sugar, which is actually kind of nice. Like there's an update ID method because uh, updating or finding a field based on only the underscore ID is so common that he added a method that doesn't make you. Like given an entire BSON matcher, instead you can just give a single uh, a single item that you expect to match the underscore ID, and there's an upsert method rather than passing another parameter to update. But otherwise, it's sort of very very intuitive. It does a lot of the nice things that you would expect from a driver. It pools connections uh, with only a tiny bit of extra work from the norm. Uh, this cluster discovery, so if you give it a single URL for a node or replica set, it'll discover everything in the set. Read reference off has pretty has baked in. Uh, the VSON implementation in Go is also written by Gustavo. It's it kind of looks here like it's a sub package of MGO, but it's or Mango, but it's not actually. You can use it on its own, but it's mainly used 
for interfacing with MongoDB and for use with the actual Go driver for MongoDB. And a slight tangent, which is actually worth talking about because it's something very nice that the driver did, is that, and this is sort of a, a good reason to use it, to look at it, is that it has sort of an ODM built into it. So Go allows you to, so part of Go is that you can define arbitrary string tags for struct fields. So you can say, and this is mainly what they're supposed to be used for, is marshalling from like other data formats into a struct within Go. So you can define a tag that, or you can namespace the tag. So it's like, this is a struct, the definition of a struct. It has three fields. It has an ID, and a create time, and a display name. And then each of those fields has a tag associated with it. So the tag of it is underscore ID, CT, uh, D underscore name. So then when when you make a call to, this is calling the task collection, then running a find one and unmarshalling it into a task, into a variable of type task, or, or type reference to a task. When, when you do that, you don't need to sort of have any middleware that's going to look at the return value from the database and like put it into your own struct. Instead, Mango actually knows that, okay, I'm going to take the document back from the database I'm going to look at the underscore ID field and marshal that, unmarshal that into the uppercase ID field of this struct. I'm going to take the CT field, marshal it to create time, et cetera. And it also works the other way. So you don't need to worry about, like, if you want to insert something or update something, you don't need to worry about populating BSON on your own and then shoving it off. You can just say insert and then the name of a struct that has the right tags. So this is really nice. Uh, so you kind of get this for free when you use Mongo or Mango, and you don't need to write anything else on top of it. It makes the use very easy. Okay, so now that I've gone over a little bit about Go, uh, sort of how it interfaces with MongoDB, I'm going to go a little bit into the projects that we're actually using Go for uh, and how we decided to do that. The first one, uh, which I'm going to go into a little bit, I'm going to go into more detail about uh, after this kind of section of the talk is our new backup service that we recently released. Uh, it's basically, it's hosted backups for MongoDB. Uh, we host it, you install a single agent on your machine. That agent pulls your data and sends it to us, and we back it up, and we can do like point-in-time restores. Uh, we take certain snapshots of it, so if you want to restore to a certain uh, snapshot, we can just send the data over to you. And of course, it supports sharding clusters. So a brief overview of how it works, because it's relevant to uh, sort of the idea of why we decided to use Go for it, is there's a single agent. <laughs> for those of you who use MMS, it's very similar, or who use the MMS monitor agent, it's sort of very similar to how that works. It means it sits on your machine, it sits on the customer's machine, uh, connects to the MongoD, syncs all the data from it, and then starts tailing the op log. So it acts a lot like a secondary. But it's a very lightweight process because instead of, sorry, instead of actually storing the data in any way, it actually just sends it back to us where we store it. So we, our backend storage has the actual off-log operations and a deduplicated like storage of your data. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more in a second. What's an off-log? An off-log is, sorry, so when you have a, a replica set, when you have like multiple nodes in a set, um, an off-log is basically, it's just a log that, the, that all three of them keep of every operation that's applied to the database, and then the primary keeps that op log. Uh, so it's just a, it's basically a circular buffer of operations that have been made, uh, writes, updates, delete, deletes, and then the secondary is the way that the secondaries stay in sync with that is they basically read off, keep peeling off the end of the primaries version and applying those to its own data. So we just do something very similar. <laughs> Okay, so the backup agent is the part that sits on the customer's machine. Uh, it was originally written in Java, and it worked. Uh, it was, we were pretty happy with it, but we sort of started to see some deployment issues. <clears throat> Sorry. Because it's a process that lives on the customer's machine. So Java can be a little bit of a headache for deploying to a customer's machine, because you know if they have a different, if they have a different uh, version of Java or a different like distribution of Java or different JVM than we had originally intended. Things can kind of, we might have quirks that we don't expect, we might have issues, 
Uh, plus, it might rely on other installed libraries, so they might not have to install the actual actual jar for the Java driver for MongoDB. So we that we realized that that was probably going to be an issue, and we wanted to sort of make uh, it ideally it should be a situation where they can just go to our website, click a button, download a single program, and run it without having to worry about any sort of extra deployment on their machine, any sort of extra configuration of their boxes or installation of things. So Go was really nice for this. First of all, it's compiled, but it's also, I didn't mention, it's statically linked, which means that all of the libraries that a program needs are actually compiled into the binary, which means so it doesn't link against anything that it expects to be there on the target machine where it runs. So that means that Go liners are very large, but they have zero dependencies. You can just drop one onto a machine and run it, and it has all the libraries that it needs packaged within it. So this is perfect for us. Uh, it also cross-compiles very easily. Basically, when you compile a Go program, all you have to do is set these Go OS and Go Arch flags, environment variables, uh, and then it'll compile it for the correct distribution. And Go XC is just like a really nice wrapper that someone wrote that compiles it for any platforms that you might need. So yes, yeah, so we at this point, the backup agent is rewritten in Go. Uh, it's in production in Go, and we've sort of had a great experience with it. It's it was picked up, written very quickly without sort of a high learning curve. Our developers had a really easy time with it, and really enjoyed working with it, and it's working exactly like we expected to. So now we're going to move on to our next project that uses it what I work on. So we sort of weren't happy with the build system that we were using and had a couple of issues with the, a lot of the continuous integration systems that were on the market, uh, things like Jenkins or Travis. They just didn't like quite fit our needs. So we decided we were going to roll our own just like homebrew continuous integration system, which basically is a facility to just constantly be building or compiling and testing different versions of MongoDB so that we can know if it's passing all the tests, if it compiles correctly, uh, if it works on all the distributions we intend. Uh, so we built it, we wanted it to be parallelizable, we wanted it to be flexible, because we wanted to be able to use it to sort of test the drivers, to test MMS, to test itself, and we're interested in open sourcing it at some point, and it's not much good to open source a product that can only be used to test MongoDB. Yeah. So, <laughs> Okay, so the way it works in a nutshell is there's a single master machine which stores all the necessary configuration. It has a, back <coughs> it has a backing database. Uh, it pulls GitHub for changes to the actual MongoDB source, checks if those changes, pulls down basically versions that need to be compiled and tested, and then periodically compiles an agent process that we wrote, sends that process over to a worker machine. That process kicks off the task as a sub-process of itself, and then reports back to the master machine. Uh, it does. Um, we've been we've been looking at transitioning it to using Git hooks. Uh, for for the moment, it was sort of quicker to get it off the ground with a polar, but we definitely have to take it for at least investigating the Git hooks. Um, the yeah, so there's a bunch of worker machines running. They all run these steps. We have the agent that runs on them, and then they report back to the master machine whether the task failed, succeeded, uh, sent back the logs. <clears throat> so the issues that we saw with this were sort of with the agent were very similar to kind of what we saw with the backup agent. We have a program that we want to be able to run on a lot of different machines, on a lot of different distributions. Um, theoretically, I mean, anything that we need to support MongoDB on, we need to support this program on because we need to be able to build and test. So we need to be able to run these steps and compile it through this program on those machines. So we wanted there to be very few dependencies also, because a lot of these machines are actually dynamically spun up via EC2 when we when the master program realizes that it needs them. So we wanted, I mean, it's kind of a nightmare to have an EC2 machine that you automatically spin up and then it needs a lot of setup done on it, or it needs someone, or it needs like the program to SSH in to run like a ton of commands, check a lot of different output, and install things. But we also didn't want to create these really sort of bulky custom AMIs. We wanted to be able to use the most vanilla ones possible, just to avoid kind of like an offset. 
Um, so Go obviously is very nice for this because the binaries are statically linked. You can just drop it in and go. Uh, we actually don't need any dependencies for the actual program, and the, the actual agent program. We also, something that was a little bit, uh, this turned out to be a huge bonus, was that since Go compiles so quickly, <coughs> the, the code changes a lot and is actually rebuilt dynamically by the program when it detects that its own code has changed. So we didn't, since that's part of the program flow, we didn't want that to sort of block and stall and take a long time while it's compiling uh, before we could actually run. Because there's really no reason for a compile stage or if our engineers are waiting on test results, there's really no reason to delay those tests because we're compiling our own program and taking a long time. Um, yeah, so this is, I mean, it's another situation where we sort of decided, okay, we'd like to use Go, we're interested in it, we picked it up, we learned Go, we learned it very fast, it's a very, as I mentioned, a very sort of simple language, easy to learn, and it's another thing where we just had a great experience. The whole thing is actually written in Go, and it's getting to be a pretty good project right now, but it's really not difficult to maintain. Uh, it's been pretty sort of simple to keep together in the structure. Uh, there's a little bit of maintenance uh, of course, what we like wrapped our head around how to organize a Go project, but it's we think it became pretty clear, and it's sort of definitely something that I would have chosen Go for again if we were going back and making the whole decision anew. Okay, so that's actually it for the first part of the talk. Before I go into more details about the backup service, but I think there any that was sort of a lot. Are there any questions or anything within within there? Um, so I think we get behind you with uh, that. Thank you. Uh, could you define the name master master means uh, Mango's machine? Uh -huh. You have like a work machine, master machine. Mm -hmm. Could you define what's the master machine? Who's who's owns that master machine? You're referring to the 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 um, painting. The, or the, the continuous build system, or the or the Mongo master slave thing. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. The one master machine. Who's who? Is, who control that the master machine? So that's just a single. Um, it's like a pretty bulky, easy to instance that we have a that has basically it runs all of the programs that are central to the continuous integration system working. It runs the all of the sort of. The schedule, the scheduler for the different worker machines, uh, it has the it has all of sort of everything that interfaces with the actual database that we use as backing storage. It holds our UI server and it holds the API server that all of the worker machines report back to on their progress. So it's basically at some point, at a certain point, we needed a sort of central brain of the whole system, and. <clears throat> It's a bunch of different processes, but they all kind of live together on one machine. So this means a uh, continuous machine. Mach yeah, this, this machine now currently uh, referring to machine here, right? In at the mangoes, or it's at the client side. Um, that's a central machine. So it's one. The he machine located here. We have it here. Yeah. Um, well, it's an EC2, but we. It's a machine that if you were running your own, if when eventually this is open source, then you would be running, sort of downloading it and running your own deployment of it. Um, you would be installing these processes onto a machine that you would run them on. So you would be installing the, the brain of your system on a machine that you wanted. Uh, but for our purposes, we keep it as a single machine that we have easy to. So, uh, so like if you, if you were going to, if once the code is open source, if you were going to pull it down and start testing your system, you wouldn't be using the same master machine that we're using. You would have to set up your own via the code that's on here. But you were next. Yeah. So how about uh, other than GitHub, you support uh, SVN and CVS also? Did, will they support yeah. SVN and CVS? Yeah. Um, it, there's no reason it wouldn't. There's no reason it shouldn't. Uh, we just, since we use Git, the, the first module that we've written for it is for Git, but there's, 
there's nothing in the design that it shouldn't be able to support, that it wouldn't be able to support SVM CVS if you want to write a module for it. Git supports SVM CVS, doesn't it? Git supports SVM CVS, right? Yeah. something. Uh, first of all, Go counts unused imports as a compiler, unused variables are a compiler, and um, that, I mean, if you're just debugging something and like throwing down print lines to make sure it's working, that can get pretty annoying. But you sort of learn to live with it, and there's, no, there's also ways of mitigating that. There's a lot of sort of ways of telling you to ignore things, but that, at first, uh, is slightly frustrating. Also, it's because it's like a very flexible language, and since it doesn't have like a rigid class structure that you always use for everything, it's when you're like first sort of looking at how a project should be set up, it's not exactly intuitive always that it should be like, okay, one class does this, then it talks to a class that does this, it has these sort of subclasses. Uh, instead, you sort of need to mess around with it a little bit to figure, to get the actual structure right. right? Part of that is just why it's, I mean, it's very flexible, so it's, yeah, it's up being, yeah, it's being a little challenging now. So you do a nightly build, you do a nightly build, or it's a continuous every commit you do start building? Um, oh, for this, yeah. we have a, I'm sorry, did you? No, it's about, are you doing every nightly build kind of? Every night you build continuously for everything, or for every comment you do start building things. We do it like we right now we have it uh, every like X commit, so we do it for like a time threshold. So like if it's been a certain every commit, if it's been a certain time since the last one that we built, and then if one gets skipped in there that we really want to build, we kick it off manually. We just have like a button in the UI that kicks it off manually. So one more should I? progress on to backup. <laughs> so so this is going to be a little bit different. This is a sort of overview of how our, of how our new backup service works and just a little bit about sort of how it, how it's used, how it works, uh, what the ideas behind it are. So first of all, what is MongoDB Management Service? Uh, so it's sort of, MMS was originally Mongo Monitoring Service, and we're sort of expanding it to be more of a suite of tools for working with MongoDB. Uh, the monitoring is, has been around a long time. It's very, very mature, and it's basically it's an agent that you install that sits on your machine, talks to your MongoDBs, and then sends the stats back to us. So if you want to go online to the mms.tengen.com and you can look at a lot of sort of things that might help you debug why things are slow or why something might have crashed, God forbid, or sort of just help you basically tune your tune your entire cluster. So uh, things like database stats, op counters, page, page faults, index hits, uh, a lot of other things that you might want to see. So that's, that's entirely free and we're sort of expanding the more it to be a suite of tools. So the next one that we that we're rolling out that was released pretty recently is hosted backups. So it's a service I was mentioning where we actually store data for you that's backing up your data. How it works. Uh, the overview I sort of went over on the other on the other talk, but I'll just mention quickly that it's a single agent, it sits on your machine, it talks to your MongoDB, sends the data back to us, we store it, we take periodic snapshots, and we store the op log and entries that you're sending back to us. What's that point in time you can snapshot? Are those the same thing? They're not the same thing. So the way that, so the point in time, that's, the, that's another slide, but I'll 
cover it now. So, because it's relevant. So, basically, we, we do the initial sync, we get all the data, we take a frozen snapshot of it, then we start getting the op logs. So every six hours, we take a, like a frozen snapshot of the data uh, and store that in like a block storage. And then we store 48 hours worth of op log. So basically, you can, do, you can do a point in time restore from any time in the last 48 hours. Because what we do is say you want to do one for 2 o'clock or 2 p.m. And the last, we have a snapshot at 12. We don't have a snapshot at 2. All we have to do, if this is in the last 48 hours, we still have those op logs, we just take the snapshot from noon, and we apply the op logs that happen between that and 2 p.m., and then we have a point in time for 2 p.m. So they're sort of part of the same uh, whole system. For sharded clusters, uh, we pause the balancer every six hours to take a snapshot. The balancer is the process that ensures uh, that basically chunks within different shards are sort of balanced pretty well, that you're not going to have a ton of chunk. If you see like one shard is getting a lot more writes than the other, and it ends up having a lot more data on it, the balancer will split that data into chunks and move those chunks around to other shards to ensure that sort of all the shards have a similar amount of data. So we, in order to take a sort of consistent snapshot of a sharded cluster, we have to turn that process off, because otherwise we might end up, if we take uh, a snap, if we like take a snapshot of data at one point, and then take a snapshot of somewhere of another shard later, there could be data loss potentially uh, if a chunk is in motion. So what we do is we insert a no-op token in all of the, the op logs for every replica set in the shard, as well as for the Mongo S routers, which are the just the process that you actually connect to from the application that routes queries to the appropriate shard based on what data is there. We yeah, we create a no-op across those, across the Mongo S, and across the config servers, which are just the three MongoDs that contain metadata for the cluster that the Mongo S uses to store bookkeeping about what shards are, or what chunks of data are on which shards. So then once we have that, we have sort of a point in time that we can, yeah, we apply the op log to our own replica sets until that point, and then we have a, a snapshot of your data at that point that we can restore to where we're assured that there's no data loss, there's no data in motion at the time that we're taking the snapshot, and we can be certain that we're not giving you faulty data back, that we're giving you consistent data when you restore. Uh, so I, I mentioned point in time, basically, restore to any point in time within the last 48 hours because that's where we have off logs from, as well as any snapshot that we've taken from before that. Uh, for restoration, you either pull from a custom URL that we can give you, or you can request that we push it, we SCP it directly to your machines, and this gives you the tar GZ data files, so you can actually just open those, drop in a MongoD and start it, and you should be fully restored and fully working. And a lot of people actually use this because, so we give unlimited free restores because another sort of nice benefit from it is that if you want to create a QA environment or create a, like, a, <clears throat> a dev environment without, with all the same data as your production system, without backing up the production system while you're getting that data, you can just pull it, you can just restore from us, have that data, set up a QA environment using it, or a dev environment, and and you'll be good and you haven't heard your production system at all. This is a confidence slide that basically, the, since the backup system was created by the same people that created MongoDB, uh, we know what we're doing. We, it was created by people with a lot of experience using and backing up MongoDB, so they sort of knew where the pitfalls were and how to ensure consistency, how to ensure that there aren't any issues with using it and that everything sticks around and is perfectly um, exactly what you would expect it to be. Uh, so this, it really obliviates any need to be writing any sort of custom backup scripts because we're backing it up for you. A quick, so quickly on how to get started with MMS. Uh, this is for MMS as a whole, which is monitoring and the backups. So 
If you have an account at mms.tenjet.com, you can install the monitoring agent on your deployment. And both, the, both an account with MMS and the monitoring agent itself are completely free. And we highly recommend that anyone using MongoDB uses these. Uh, they're very quick. It's very quick to set up. And if something does go wrong or you start to see slow queries or you want to sort of tune the performance of your system, you can look at mms.tengen.com, go to your go to the sort of the graphs for your databases and see exactly what's happening in your cluster. For the backups, uh, you go to tengen.com, mms.tengen.com backups. You install the backup agent, uh, the Go program I was talking about earlier. Earlier, you point it to your MongoD. Yeah, you start off the sync, and you're good. You have backups.